All right, Christy, thank you very much for joining myself and Boz today. Yeah, super excited to be here to talk to you guys. And you know, to let everybody know, and you know, we'll we'll put some uh, info on you in, in the bio or whatnot. But I mean, anyone who knows Cross has been around for a while is probably quite familiar with you. I mean, you, I you know, went to the game seven times, six as an individual. That's, yeah, that's correct. I believe you know, and just were regularly like a. a you know, a, a top contender, always in the mix, you know, in the best heats, just, you know, that was a really, really long, awesome uh, a period of your life that, uh, is it safe to say, you know, you've you've officially, quote unquote, you know, retired from trying to make it to the games? It's definitely safe to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <That's the longest> <laughs> it was, was that decision uh a hard one was it just time do you ever have it like tug on your heartstrings every now and then or are you you're good yeah uh i don't feel a tug on my heartstrings every now and again um i knew i was ready so i always i got into crossfit because i like fitness and i wanted to challenge myself and do all these cool things and do different stuff and then i became so hyper focused on it and i think i even probably you know like the amount of training required almost became probably past healthy realistically like there's mm, yeah sure so focused like i had to dial everything and so i just came to the point where i was like i want to do these other things too that i feel like we're going to take away from like this training that we had meticulous, meticulously laid out and i just felt like i didn't have the space mentally or even the time to go do these other things and so I could just feel that starting to happen. And so I sat with it for a while. And obviously it's sad. Like I cried when I said it out loud and you just thinking of all the hard work and all the memories you put in like to get to where you were and that real like chapters are closing. But at the same time, another chapter is opening and you can do all these other things with this fitness you've built. So yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think that's um that's got to be true for any big chunk of time that you invest into a thing, you know, whatever that thing is. I mean, seven years is significant to be at the top of, of anything and, and to mm -hmm. invest the time that it takes to get on top of that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's huge. Uh, and I, I do think that's cool. What you said too, we were talking a little bit before the cameras clicked on just about this idea of, Hey, I have this base of fitness and I can do other things with it. You know, we were saying kind of collectively, it's like, Hey, that was kind of the point in the beginning. When you start thinking about the philosophy around CrossFit, it was like, Hey, I have this big, broad base of fitness and it serves as a launching pad for whatever else I want to do. So that's really cool to come back to that and, and use that as an exploration. I think that's great. Um, and what a great outlet that you, you know, all that time that you put into the competitive end of things. I mean, certainly that's going to set you up for whatever you want to do next physically. That's cool. I'm, I'm curious. I like to consider myself and Adrian normal human beings. And I think <laughs> individuals <laughs> like you, Christy, <laughs> are not normal in some ways in the, in the best. And I mean that in the best of ways, like you got better stuff uh, than I did. And, and, and maybe not just genetically, but also like maybe some work ethic between the ears, drive, ambition, goal setting, like all those intangible things as well. I mean, your mom went to the games. I mean, there's, there's, there's something going on, something going on there as well. I mean, from the very earliest that you can remember where, you know, athletics, you know, did you have the drive and ambition to pursue fitness related goals and you were also well adapted to doing that? Or did you, you know, were you just good at it and then the passion developed or you liked it and you had to work really hard? Like what was the combination that led you into this being such a big part of your life? Um, I think it's something that kind of grew, especially from my parents, but my mom and dad would tell you I was the laziest kid they ever had. Like I wouldn't oh, really? write <laughs> I wouldn't okay, so get there's, out of there's a my daughter. I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Okay. She would be so mad. Like mm. all she wanted to do was go for a run and I like would not get in the stroller or I mean I wouldn't walk. I wouldn't ride my bike. Like she'd I'd make her push me in the stroller. Like oh, that's so a riot. Would be, kind of joke about it that I'm like, they're not sure where this came from. Um, but I do remember at a younger age, like they put us in every sport. So they just let it, they never wanted us to like have to specialize or have to pick. They just wanted us to meet all different friends and play all different sports and just kind of try to find stuff that we enjoyed doing. And then she actually was a really good runner. So she ran a sub three hour marathon. And I remember yeah. watching oh, her wow. at the Boston marathon and thinking like, this would be really cool. Like, what if I could do this one day? And so then I got into swimming and I just kind of always had a knack for like the longer stuff. She was big into cycling and she had, uh, she got a new bike and then would let me ride or not let me. She just kind of was like, Hey, do you want this one? Like, so then I'd go out and do some hundred mile rides with her. And you know, 
I just really liked the challenge of the endurance world and like that transferred over into CrossFit, like the challenge of getting stronger. And then um, when I swam in college, the same thing, like we had really long swim practices on Saturday. And like, I remember kind of like emptying out my goggles when I'd cry and, you know, it's just like, can I get through this? And I, that internal drive of feeling really satisfied when I finished something really hard uh, yeah. is really what kept me going, like very goal oriented where I'd write like my swim meet times in high school on my bathroom mirror. Nobody was telling me to do that. I just like wanted to visualize it. I wanted to see it. I wanted to accomplish it. And, you know, it's kind of funny when you do accomplish something then you're like already on the next thing, but it's just that moment of satisfaction. And I really do think the journey and the process of like, what can I, or what can I physically do that is just very satisfying. So I guess it's kind of evolved throughout my life, but mm. I just like to see, I was kind of going through, like, we obviously rode a marathon at the CrossFit Games, which is something I hope I never have to do again. And oh I never really will. Um, run a marathon, uh, half marathon, 100 mile rides. Now I've just threw high rocks in, like just trying to do all these different things just to see what it's like. And so that's just kind of, I guess, my internal drive. That it's, has it's interesting. Developed over the, years. <laughs> you talk about, uh, you know, all of these really difficult things and getting into swimming, using that as an outlet. And yet on the other side, like your parents describing you as the lazy one, did, awesome. as a kid, did you have a recollection or was your perception that like, yeah, I have siblings that are way more hard charging than me? Or did, were you kind of oblivious to that? And then the follow up is, d do you remember a time when you kind of turned the corner? Was it in high school when you started taking swimming seriously or like what, what switched uh, if there was any perception on your side anyway, that, that you were actually a little, you know, less hardworking than, than your siblings, I yeah. guess. I think I was definitely oblivious. Like I okay. just yeah. kind of did it. I, I don't think I realized like I would cry when my mom would drop me off at swim practice. Like I'm like, I just don't want to do this. Like, why am I going? Mm. And then it became this love. So it's mm. something that I'm grateful that, I mean, they, they encouraged me to keep going. Um, and then I ended up finding it and just, I guess, throughout the, the process. So yeah, I was completely oblivious, which is kind of also funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'd say I found it in high school when I was like, okay. oh, this would be really cool to, you know, I was always playing all the sports in grade school. I made a ton of friends. That was like my social time. I enjoyed, I thought I was good at basketball, but I was like four foot nothing. So I'd be like under the, <laughs> all of the really tall people. And there's some really funny videos like, yeah, that's probably not going very far. Um, same with volleyball. Like, yeah, I'm not the tallest athlete. I'm only a five foot one at, you know, 34 years old. So, um, and then just soccer was a really big outlet, swimming. And I ended up swimming in college just because my sister played soccer and I wanted to do something different. Like mm. I didn't want to feel like there was any sort of comparison. I just wanted to go a different route. And I'm really grateful that I did because of the friends that I made. But um, yeah, I guess in high school, just kind of looking at what was next, I couldn't imagine my life without fitness or uh, being in sport. And so that's what led me to want to pursue it in college. And I think that a lot of that was just the push that it gave me and it was an outlet and that's where I made my best friends. So it sounds like there is a element of of kind of sticking with it too. Wait, I think it's really interesting what you said there. And sorry to cut you off, Pat. Are oh, you good? But uh, um, you know, didn't like it at first, but then something happened, and I, I think that there's a lesson in there somewhere about, hey, you know, sometimes something right out the gate might not appeal to you, but if you give it enough time to kind of settle, man, some cool things can happen. So that's really cool to uh, to share that. Thank you, Pat. Sorry, it's, it's such a cool like. I don't, I don't know if your mom's like the hardcore sports parent, but I love like the discipline that whatever, like to drop off the crying child of practice. And it's like, I know you're crying. See you in three hours. You know, like, it's great. Like, and, uh, you know, and I did not swim in college, but I know a fair amount of swimmers. And it seems like those college swim practices where they're like just deaf by volume. I mean, you're going for meters and meters and hours. And, you know, I had, look back up that it's on 2011 so what five years before you even showed up to the games you took seventh in your age division in the national championship for El olympic distance triathlon so that's crazy you talked about the 100 mile races with uh, your mom and marathons and stuff like have you always had have you always just loved going long or is that just did you that, gravitate towards that um actually that came in college so i was a sprint breaststroker and really? Yeah. So I was the best at the 50 breaststroke, which has Interesting. It's not an event in college unless it's in a relay, which is like, oh man, the 50 is so fun. Um, and then I liked the hundred. I hated the 200, but it was like just the next event that I had to swim. And so I was, that was always like perplexed my coach. Just like, I 
had a group of friends and I went to the University of Louisville and right around the Kentucky Derby, they do something called the mini marathon. Most people call them a half, but it's called a mini. And a bunch of the girls from the swim team signed up. So I was just like, okay, like, let's do it. I like to run. I jumped into track and cross country in high school. Like I would always just kind of do different things. And I did pretty well. And I just had this really weird urge to the way the course runs, you run the first 13 together and then the marathon marathon peels off and you head in. And I remember being like, I really want to turn right. Like I want to keep going and see how far (laughs) I can actually go. And all my friends were like, what? So the next year they all signed up for the mini and I signed up for the full. And I was like, well, let's just see. Like, can I make it? I think so. Um, So that just really started to come during college. Like I never thought I would really, I remember my mom running the Boston Marathon and thinking it was cool, but There was never like growing up where I was like, oh, I'm going to be an endurance athlete or I'm going to do this. And then I did triathlons only when I, I believe I was still in college. It was 2011. I was just graduating just as a void to um, fill all of that time that I had spent swimming, like just to do something, to have something to train for because I missed it. And so I just kind of had a swimming background. My mom had a bike and I had run in the past and I kind of took a nap like I liked it. So I figured I could put those pieces together and move ended up doing okay. I never did as well as I'd hoped to on that. And then I found CrossFit and just didn't look back. And I just stopped doing triathlons altogether. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, CrossFit can become a uh, very immersive, you know, mm-hmm. I, you know, when I was studying up for, you know, chatting with you today, you know, you made, you've made mention before that your previous occupation was in corporate accounting, right? And that that was yeah. just so unbelievably <laughs> unpleasant and hellacious, you know, that like motivated you to take a leap and do something else. And, and I'm sure you don't miss that at all. But I have to remind you that had you stuck with it, you would be in tax season right now. Like you would be, <laughs> you would be, my father was a lifelong accountant. So I know tax season and how they just disappear and the stress and the misery. So you're probably this time of year, you should be so happy that you, you chose health and fitness over being, you know, corporate accounting. Yeah, that was that. And that is kind of funny. Like my first mantra was like, when I'd be hard workouts, like on the game floor, I'd be like literally saying to myself, like, this is better than accounting. Like, you're trying to do this. this is better than accounting. Like, that's what I would be back in 2016 and 2017 when I was trying to push through a really hard workout. And before I'd go on the floor, Patrick, he was my boyfriend at the time. He'd look at me and be like, this is still better than accounting, right? I'm like, mm-hmm. This is really better than <laughs> That's awesome. I guess it's I just one, one question on that before... Um... I'm sure Adrian has some, but I got a, a question about that because what I found so fascinating about it was you made, you know, I watched your your video that you made when you were saying that you were going to walk away from trying to make it to the games and all that. And you mentioned, you know, the corporate accounting piece. And I might get it, I might get it wrong a little bit, but you said something along the lines of um, you went from corporate accounting, which you could say was a safe job, right? To uh, working part time at Starbucks and coaching CrossFit classes, and trying to pursue your athletic goals, most people, right, would be like, "You're crazy!" You're like, you know who? How many people want to be an athlete and pay the bills? Like, you have a a zero point nothing shot of making that happen. You have this corporate career in the quote unquote real world, and you're going to give that up for fitness? Like, you're insane! Don't do it. It's like a really courageous uh, mm-hmm. thing that you did. Can you just? walk me through a little bit of of that that's gutsy that was yeah I mean I'm not usually a really gutsy person I kind of I'm grateful for that Christy that took that chance um I was really nervous so I started in actually I started as an auditor for KPMG so I was like pursuing my CPA and then I switched into corporate accounting and I was working full-time there and Somebody at the gym, they were going to open a second gym. So I, I always love fitness. They were good friends. And they're like, okay, like I can help you if you get certified. Like we can, you can help me with this gym. And so then I just got better at CrossFit. And I was like, I think I want to do this. And so, but looking at, you know, the pay scale, going to working at a CrossFit gym, coaching hourly classes, and then giving up like all the benefits and like right. accounting job, mm-hmm. the whole full-time thing. I was like, this is probably, you know, a little scary. So to make me feel a little bit better, just having, a, I guess, the accounting brain, I ended up picking up that part-time job at Starbucks and I'd open at five o'clock in the morning. So we'd get there at 4.30, we'd work till 11, I'd get like a little lunch and then I'd go 12 to eight at the CrossFit gym and squeeze my Jeez, training in and wow. all that. Um, <laughs> and so it was, it was scary, but when you're so passionate about something and you have a support system, it's like, I'm willing to do everything and anything for this and I'm not going to stop until I do. And I think if you can just, 
put the work in. And, and I think that's just really what it comes down to is, you know, I, looking back, I, the, the amount of hours, like I wasn't sleeping very much. How do you recover? Like, but when you're so driven and you just kind of have your mind set on something, like you're willing to do what it takes. And I think that's the most important piece. So absolutely terrifying. My parents were just kind of like, you're doing what? Like, what? what? <laughs> Hold on. like can we just talk about this? And then Patrick yeah. was and he was like super supportive. He's like, quality of life. And I'm like, looking back, we still kind of joke about it because good they knew for you. Me, you know, a couple of years, but they're he's probably like, yeah. probably, I convinced you to do this. And they still like liked me and supported you and like all of this stuff. But you know, it worked out. And I do think I I think I truly believed that you know, I could do it. And I was just so passionate, I think, in the end, about health and fitness. Like I wanted to go mm-hmm. into exercise science. I wanted to go that route. And I ended up going into business because it was the safer thing. And mm-hmm. I'm just a really big believer in my quality of life. And I just felt like I looked down like a looking glass and seeing what I was going to be doing for the next 40 years. And I just felt like I couldn't do it. And so I was like, well, if I don't make I think you made a great out, decision. As somebody who I get, my father was an accountant, I think you made a fantastic yeah. decision. <laughs> and I, I just uh, think, yeah. and I, I'm not telling everyone, like, go quit your job. Like, definitely have a point of some sort. But um, I, I do think there's something to be said. We only get one life. And it's just yeah. like, I just felt so strongly pulled one way that I was like, well, let's just do it. And well, it just, just you know. Out. Th- that will be the title of this podcast is Christy says, quit your job. No. Yeah, absolutely. hundred yes. percent. Yeah. Have a plan. Well, I, Have a plan. I, uh, oh man, that's such a cool story. I, I didn't know that. And I think that, um, I wholeheartedly concur, you know, a little calculated risk, I think is such an important thing, especially as a young person, right? Like you're talking about, you're just out of college. Uh, you know, y- you've got time at that point. I really think that everybody in their life should take a leap of faith like that to some degree and not totally unthinkingly, not just off the cuff, but, you know, put a little thought into it and and go for it. And to your point, it's certainly been my experience. um, And I'm sure that Pat's probably got something similar there too. But yeah, even if it's a little unconventional, if you are invested in it, you will figure it out. And it might not be exactly the path that you thought it would be at the outset, but life is never that way anyway. So you might as well give it a shot and uh, and go for it. And hey, this is the thing that I tell, you know, when I get the chance, I have some younger people that I get to talk to about these types of things. Um, it's like, hey, man, that corporate job is still going to be there. That's that's something that isn't going to go away, you know. <laughs> like that's something you could return to if it all crashes and burns. So, it's all you know a wash at the end of the day. Um, so I think that's just so cool. Um, backing up a little bit, what was the catalyst to get into the CrossFit gym in the first place? So you were swimming, you know. Then you fast that's- forward and you're running this crazy schedule. But like, how how did you get in the CrossFit gym for the first time? Yeah, so I heard about it for a while and I was super intimidated. Like I was really nervous. I just, I didn't think I could do it. And there was a girl named Taylor Drasher that I went to college with who oh, yeah. was working and she had been on a team and she had tried to convince me for a long time. And so there, she was actually at the gym because it was in Louisville, Kentucky. And I was like, okay, if I'm going to pick a gym, I'm going to try that one. But it took me a while. The ultimate catalyst was busy season for auditing. So I was sitting at a desk from, you know, I'd get to work at 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And then, you know, some nights was 10, 11 o'clock at night that we were getting out of there. And just, or people would want to go to happy hour. And I I quickly learned if I didn't get it in before work, then I wasn't going to be able to do it. And then I got bored of just going out for a run or I was going to just a gym down the road. And I felt like I was just like, in comparison to having a team and somebody plan everything for me and push me, I just, I just felt like I was just kind of lost. And so I figured like, okay, I'm going to give this CrossFit thing a try. There's a a 5am class. There's a a 6am class. I can get in, I can get out, hopefully start to get myself back into shape for when I'm just sitting at the desk all day. But Really, it was just striving to find, you know, also a way to stay fit and then a community because I missed having the team that I spent time with. I missed having people to train with. And I was just by myself all the time. Mm. Yeah, awesome. You know, at the end of your uh, the retirement video that I watched, you said that, you know, the new chapter or whatnot was, you know, yes, retired, but, you know, one door closes, another one opens. And now the goal was to, you know, focus on taking on new challenges, new athletic challenges. And so, you know, when I saw what happened with the High Rocks event, I wanted to chat with you here. So maybe we can start there and see if you have other athletic endeavors on your horizon that you would like to, you know, use your fitness with. So what what drew you to something outside the CrossFit world? And, you know, 
why was that high rocks? And let's let's just start to walk through that. Yeah, uh, the the outside the crossword world, like I kind of started with. That. I just love fitness. Like I always have. I love the challenge. I love just seeing what I can do and being a smaller athlete in the CrossFit world. I feel like I spent so much time trying to build strength and everything I was doing. I'm like, is this taking away from the strength that I'm working so hard to build and just to be able to compete because the girls are just so strong and, um, they're, doubt. yeah, they're, it's, in, it's honestly incredible. And so I just yeah. always felt like I was, you know, taking two steps backward if I would go out on a longer run and go out on a longer cycle. And then I just, it's not that it was just for the 1% that I needed. Like I needed every last percentage. Um, and so I was just ready in the strength stuff with harder on my body. So I was ready to not have to worry about being as strong as I possibly could. And I was ready to just kind of see, you know, all this fitness that I'd kind of cultivated over the last however many years, like what I could do with it. And the first stop was actually trying to run a sub three hour marathon. Um, but I, I was planning to potentially sign up for it in the fall and just with the way everything fell, it didn't work out. So I, uh, then was kind of sitting there and I tried to sign up for two high rocks within the last two years. So the first year, I think quarterfinals was announced. It was the same weekend. This was maybe 2021. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it would have been 2021. because That's when I went to Grand Games. So I was like, oh, I don't want to really do it the same weekend. Like, I, I really need to make it right. through whatever's next. Like, this is probably not a great idea. So then Kristen Holta and I were going to do one on a team last year. Um, oh, that'd be a good up. team right there. Yeah. Incredible team. I was going to go to, I think it was England. Um, I was going to meet her over oh, there. Cool. Just because she was yeah. retired. Um, and so we thought that'd be super fun. But then she ended up uh, getting pregnant and being due with her son not she just wasn't feeling up for all the running so it was like okay we'll put that on hold so um then this year i was just like talking to my husband i was like we used to do all this stuff together like let's do something let's do something different and so i just came back to that for that reason because i had looked at doing two previously and just having last the last competition i did i guess was the marathon i was like let's just see like what this is like i keep hearing Sam Dancer said he had done one. Like I keep hearing about all this high rock stuff. Like I just want to go see what it's about. And so we literally picked the one that I thought it was the week after the open and it ended up falling on the last week of the open. So we ended up missing our gym Friday night lights, but they were very supportive and they were okay about it. Um, but we picked it because I had a direct flight. And so mm. that was really just mm. like, we picked Houston and it turned out Mal O'Brien was there, which was kind of crazy. And then also the buttery bros. So there's a little oh, bit of crap wow. in there, which was kind of fun, <laughs> but we had no idea. Quite a coincidence. Yeah. So yeah. we just fell into that. Um, but we just wanted to experience the community because we kept hearing it was like, you know, if you sign up for a 5k or you sign up for a 10k, mm -hmm. CrossFit's so rooted in community. And that's what got me started in the first place. I thought I'd just go check something new out with no pressure and just for fun. You, yeah, you casually cool. mentioned that you did a marathon, but you didn't, you didn't say that, but correct the wrong. Three. You didn't, you didn't 304. And that yeah. was holding what? So you held a seven minute and three second pace per mile for 26.2 miles that yeah and that was a couple months after the game so just kind of crazy wow um, yeah but the cool thing about that is like i ran three marathons before crossfit and then i stopped for 10 years or however long and then i ran this one and i was six minutes faster after you mm. know all the crossfit training and stuff so i think that's just something to be noted and something really cool did yeah, you that is I, cool let me get one more sorry I'm yeah, just so yeah, yeah go ahead did you train for the marathon is a genuine question or you know did you start to build like what's your weekly volume if you like to run anyway did you just dive right in did you did you do a certain protocol i mean what led to you knocking well, out this 304 i wouldn't recommend this for people um I, <laughs> we have a, a challenge do we run challenges with our ibex training which is our online group that follows all of our training programs and we started a 5k a day and that was september 1st so uh -huh. the games happened in august and i was like all right it's 5k a day and i was doing my 5k and like Two weeks in, I ran like eight miles. And my husband was like, well, it's 5K, like 3.1 miles. And I was like, I know, but I felt good. And I was like, you know, I think I could do a marathon. And so he like started laughing. And um, I ran to the gym that day. And there's a group there that was doing the half marathon in the middle of October. And they're like, you should do it. And I was like, come on, Pat, like, let's do it. And I was like, still going on half. And he's like, no, no. Like, if I'm running the half, you need to run the whole. So I was like, okay, I'll try it and see. Um, and I was honestly really nervous because I didn't feel super prepared. But I did hmm. like a 13 miler. And then I jumped to 17. And I jumped to 21. And then I dropped off for a week and then went and ran it. 
Um, and so my mileage was not what you would expect, like for most people, but I was training in the gym. I was doing all of these other things. My tendons, ligaments, my joints were strong. Um, and I just had fitness. So I just trusted that I could do it. And so that I, I started training September 1st and I ran it, I think it was like October 15th or 16th. Wow. So not totally recommended for people starting to run. Hey, um, yeah. Was- my previous point, you just, you build with better stuff between the ears <laughs> and, and I mean, for head to toe. Good for you. That's, that's absolutely uh incredible so i didn't mean to cut you off boz no no absolutely i i I am so i'm also curious about this and i think it's so cool like back to the point earlier about having this platform that you can kind of mold into different directions should you choose to do that that's really cool I'm, i'm always curious about people that do you know i think a marathon in the scheme of things it's not the most extreme thing that you can do but it's pretty extreme you know like it it takes its toll physically um and i don't just mean the effort itself but like the physical toll that you feel afterwards. And to me, at least anecdotally, that's what I hear from a lot of people that are using CrossFit as a base is that, yeah, I ran the race and I felt pretty good, maybe even surprised myself with the result, but I wasn't specifically prepared. And then the, the, the recovery kind of got me. So how was it on the back end with kind of limited mileage? Were you feeling it or did you surprise yourself there too? Um, it was nothing like recovering from the CrossFit games, like CrossFit games is 10 times worse. So yeah. I feel like my body was strong and it was ready. Um, I was, I was tired and my, like my quads, just like the quad attachments from the repetitive pounding that yep. I'm not used to. I definitely felt that. Like, I remember we were sitting down and we grabbed a beer after and I was like, Hmm, like later that afternoon, I was like, well, my knees are kind of getting a little sore. Um, but I didn't feel like I had to go down the steps backwards or anything like that. And <laughs> I uh, was like, it wasn't just like my whole body. It was really just overall fatigue, I would say. And then just more of the knees and the attachments. And that, that just comes from not having count, like spent right. as much time yeah. doing all of that pounding. And so that was yep. the main part, but I would say even like all of the competition that I've done and like where you go, those dark places, like this was more mm-hmm. drawn out. And so I just tried to stay like where I felt comfortable. I actually got really lucky and I, there were two guys running in front of me and I had no intent of running that pace. And I just like to try to find somebody that I can just see if I can hang on to. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to stay here. And they were just chatting away the whole time. And so I just kind of ran with them um, until the end. I was like, wow, like what pace are we holding? And then I felt really good and just kind of finished strong. So it it just, it's really a testament to like all the other training that I had done. But yeah, just the recovery was not nearly as bad as I feel like um, some of the other competitions that I've done. In the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear that too. That's, uh, yeah. that's really great. So kind of flip-flopping back to what Pat was talking about before the race, you know, okay, what does your training look like in preparation for this marathon, but what does it look like now? So you're kind of stepped away from the highest level of competition in CrossFit, starting to explore some other things, start with a marathon. Cause I mean, why wouldn't you, you know, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, so what does your training look like now? And is it, specified any particular way or are you just trying to you know kind of keep the base strong and then see what comes your way like how are you approaching that yeah so training i have really dialed back um i i think that you know i started crossfit for health fitness wellness to be part of a community and then i really kind of shifted that to the extreme and i mean Mm -hmm. to be good at anything you have to go to the extreme if you want to be in that one percent like you just don't have that choice Uh, but now i go about 60 minutes a day um i'll take class one to two times a week with our affiliate for the really high intensity stuff uh and then i do just a lot of i'll run three or four times a week so mileage you asked is like 25 ish mile like for a while i was running like 16 to 24 miles so we'll say 25 ish maybe up to 30 now um, miles per week. So in three, four days, give or take. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I don't do like a lot of super high skill gymnastics anymore. So I can still do, you know, 20, 30 ring muscle ups in a workout if I need to. Um, but I stick to like, I have the skill. And so I just kind of work on the muscles and stick to this, like the strict strength stuff. Cause that just leaves me feeling good. Um, and then, so kind of squat, push, pull, press, um, with, couple affiliate CrossFit classes, couple runs, maybe a couple bike rides. And I just kind of sprinkle it in where I feel good. And some weeks might have a little more of the running and some weeks might have a little more biking or something like that. But I'm just trying to find a healthy balance with what makes me feel like I can give my best to my gym, to our online community, to my family, and also feel like I'm my freshest and my best without just being in a hole 24 seven. So it's, it's been a really big learning process, but I feel like 60 minutes, and allows me to focus on other things as well. 
Well, we're we're big proponents of minimum effective dose, Amen. especially because you know a lot of our audience. We're not talking about CrossFit Games athletes. It's really not who we're uh, catering to. We're talking about normal people that have you know other jobs and responsibilities, and they just want to be fit and healthy for their real life. Limited and, free time. Yeah, I think there's always this pull when they see some really high level competitors, and they start to think, "Oh, I need two to three hours of training a day to be effective." And I think that's a real shame. So. My question in there to you is, okay, having gone through this process, what surprised you the most about kind of stepping your training back? Uh, how good I feel and how okay. you feel more, 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 more. And, you know, really like, like you're saying is if I want to feel my best, like I do enjoy Olympic lifting, but I don't snatch much anymore. Like I, I do, I like the cleans, but for me, the snatching is just not something that if I only have 45 or 60 minutes, like I'm not getting the most bang from my buck in that 45 mm -hmm. or 60 minutes. I'm focusing on, you know, the single leg work to keep me strong for running. And I'm focusing on squats, to keep my glutes and hamstrings strong. And I'm just kind of breaking it down in that sense. Um, but amazing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to train. I take, I still take a full rest day sometimes two. So, you know, I'll train five days a week. I just, I cannot believe the amount of training. I, my coach just asked me this the other day in the gym. He's like, are you as strong as you still were? Cause I'm just recovered now and I feel better and I'm just not being mm -hmm. down. So you don't need to do more, 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 more. And you really shouldn't, and you shouldn't stress about it either. It's like, get in what you can give mm -hmm. the effort that you have, and then go on with all of your other duties and then come back tomorrow. And I think consistency and understanding how important just showing up in having consistency is and that it's not necessarily about like like you said that two to three plus hours a day three sessions a day training man I you heard you heard amen. it here first folks. yeah <laughs> so. amen to that I, there's so many little tangents i could i could go off on that i will yeah. but i won't it's it's i think you're so spot on i've heard that story echoed yep you know all of us here have been around the space for a while now you know, and we've seen people come in that were new and then go through their entire career, punch into masters, maybe have a surgery or two, like, you know, and, and the lessons learned and the wisdom. And like, I've, I've heard that echoed so many times of people feeling just good, like how it feels mm -hmm. good to feel good. And some athletes get so used to living in that grind and what your knees, back and shoulders feel like that after days, weeks or months or years, you think that that's what your knees, back and shoulders should feel like. And it's mm. not. <laughs> it's it's yeah. actually not. And you can breathe some life back into it. And I will also say something you touched on a second ago. You know, while I also, you know, I, I do kip regular, you mentioned some strict gymnastics. I'm also a big advocate of everybody needs more strict pull-ups in their life. Strict pull-ups and strict yeah. gymnastics work are just fantastic. You know, kipping is wonderful as well, but man, uh I think I think plenty of people just Kip all the time. We're working some strict work back in is so beneficial and so wonderful, but they've got it into their head potentially in, you know, a, a misunderstanding of strength and conditioning or the methodology that, well, if I go strict on this workout, the time's going to be slower. And then it wasn't a mm. good workout and I wasn't fit <laughs> anymore. It's like, oh man, like it's breaking free of that and just doing some of that strict work, working those things in and, uh, and, you know, and paying attention to the clock every now and then when you when you want to burn it down, but not feeling you have to do that every single day. There's a beautiful balance that you can find as an athlete of like, you feel good, you perform well, you're recovering, knees, back and shoulders feel good. And, and to hear athletes find that homeostasis for them, it uh, it warms my heart. So I'm, I'm happy that you're on that journey. You found a good place where you just kind of you're humming right now. Yeah. yeah. And I, th I think it's a mindset shift. And I just had this conversation with people in the gym yesterday. It's like, it's just shifting your mindset. Like they're asking, are you ever going to hit those PRs again? And it's like, well, you know, maybe I, if I really want to, you know, go on a major squat, I'd be like, maybe, but at the same time, it might take away from other goals that I have. So mm -hmm. if I can move my 80 to 85% for reps and feel really strong and really good, like I'm still getting stronger. I'm not, not getting stronger. I'm just not choosing to go to 105% multiple mm -hmm. times a week or spend time in that 95% plus just because for me personally, the type of muscle fibers I have, that just breaks me down a little bit more. And I feel like it puts me more at risk potentially to get more aches and pains. And so I want to keep showing up each day. And I, the other conversation is like, you can come into the gym and work extremely hard and get a really, really great workout. 
without, so like I'll block off like, okay, today, Monday, Thursday, or whatever, like those are the workouts that I'm going to go really, really hard on. Then next workouts, I'm not just sandbagging, but I'm going to go like, you know what, yep. like, mm-hmm. a little bit lower mm-hmm. to where I'm not just at max heart rate every single day. And I'm going to be a master's, so I'm going to be 35. And I just feel like for me, I continue to get fitter and stronger by recognizing those days. And it doesn't mean that yeah. I'm I'm giving it my all, but it's like, we don't, have it. Yep. and I think just starting to understand and shift the mindset and have more conversations around that. I think people will be healthier. They'll have long longevity with the, with the, with CrossFit and yeah. that they're doing and just feel better. So you, it's fun. It's taken me a while to learn. Like I, yeah. I, uh, and still You've come to the right place, thing. but yeah, it's well, a good thing. I was going to say, you're making Pat so happy right now because that is oh. totally a Pat Sherwood strategy to name the days of the week that you're going to burn it Amen. down. And then the rest of the time, like you said, it's not that you're going to show up and just not put in the effort, but you're giving yourself permission that I don't have to die today. It's okay. Like it, the work can speak for itself. And that's the whole point. I think that's awesome. And, uh, you know, one thing I'll say that I think is a disadvantage <clears throat> to, uh, to many athletes, uh, it's, it's like such a double-edged sword. Pat was talking about you're made from better stuff. And, and I agree, like that kind of mindset to take the top of the mountain is rare, but I think it can also put people in this position where they're so tough and they're so driven Mm. that it, it, it's almost a burden because it's like, man, I know I can be doing more. And you convince yourself that you should be doing more, even when it doesn't necessarily help anything. It's just, you know, yeah, you're capable of it. You're tough enough to take it on. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to have the best outcome. And I think that's a really hard lesson to learn for somebody who is naturally driven, goal oriented, et cetera. And, and something that I've heard recently from a lot of athletes, you know, we were at um, uh, semifinal testing week not that long ago. It's a couple months back. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to speak for these athletes, so I'll leave them unnamed. But I had a conversation with a couple of them that said, hey, you know, I've, com- competition's not as important to me anymore. I'm doing more just jump in with my affiliate classes. I feel great. And you know what? I think I'm actually getting fitter. And they said this <laughs> like surprised, you know, and I'm like, there's no surprise there for me. It's It's kind of makes sense when you step back and think about it. You're giving yourself the time to recover. You're taking that mental pressure off from convincing yourself you have to be there day in and day out, just grinding away. So that's so cool to hear you talk about that mindset. I um, I think that's very, very healthy for everybody, but particularly people that are coming out of that athletic phase of their life. Because man, I kind of getting back to the, the start of the conversation, seven years is a long time to do anything. And when you're in that, and that's your life, seeing what's on the other side without any sort of mental adjustment is really difficult to do. And yeah. so I think that's so healthy to, like you said, talk about that, bring that up that like, Hey, you know what? Yeah. If you sit down and think about it, you have people around you that can help you through it. There are so many ways to express different avenues in a healthy way that you're going to be totally satisfied just in a different way. So that's, yeah, s- such a cool thing to hear from you. Yeah. I wouldn't say it happens overnight. So I think like <laughs> yeah, all of fair, fair. Like, and you have to yeah. check yourself constantly. And then, right. and then the more you yeah. can, the more you start to realize like, Oh, like, why am I actually doing all of this? Is it because I want to, or it's just because I'm, that's what I'm used to doing. So yeah. And like being clear, like being able to work through that process, I think is really important. Yeah. yeah awesome. So, well, okay. Let's, so, oh, good. Well, I was going to say, you, so you, you stepped away, you did the marathon, you just crushed this high rocks competition. What else do you have kind of on your radar that you're thinking about for some other challenge? Or, or is it just kind of you're, you're taking the approach of like, put it out there and see what comes back? Or like, do you have something that you're thinking about have, on the next step? I have something I've been looking at. So it's not too okay. far and it'll be another kind of jumping and do. Um, I haven't, I've, I haven't announced it yet. Um, okay. I'm just yep. cool. looking at it and it's been something I've been stewing on, but I wish I would have made it my mind up sooner and given myself more time to train. But um, I do have to think <laughs> kind of in the middle of April that we're getting ready to kind of hopefully pull the trigger on and commit to. So I just, right on. Have, yeah. So it'll be something I haven't done before. It'll be something that will probably be, I'm going to stay harder than a marathon run and push me really far outside my comfort zone. Um, but we'll see. It's a, it's yeah. Something coming up soon, hopefully, if we can Very cool. put all of our ducks in a line. So we'll see. You gotta, you gotta do that Barclay Marathon or whatever it is there. You know, that, that crazy. <laughs> How incredible that thing! Is. Oh my gosh! The first Unbelievable. Email. Let's Ooh. let's uh, so let's chat real quick for the the High Rocks event that you you showed up, you flew down, you went to Houston, 
you know, you're curious to have a good community feel and all that. And for anyone unfamiliar with it, I might mess it up a little bit, but it's basically like eight stations that you're going to do some work at, and you've got to run a thousand meters before each one of those eight stations. And then some of them are involved weight and some of them don't. You could be on a rower, you could be on a skier, you get a sled pull, you get a sled push, you get some wall balls, you get some sandbag lunges, things like that. So that's the, the general scheme of the event. And it's indoors, which is interesting. And so mm-hmm. you you down, you show up to this. What was it actually like? Uh, it was very different than I expected. So hmm. we went down Thursday thinking, you know, we'd have a brief on Friday and we'd have to learn about the place and everything. You don't have to do any of that. Like they send everything out by email. You get a technical briefing email because the movements are always the same and they're always in the same order. Hmm. So it's eight movements total. So you get a email with like your start time. You get an e- in the same email, it has a map of the indoor venue. So they're all indoors and the lap is around and you have to get across to the spectator area, which then they can see all the stations. So I'll kind of explain that in a second. Um, and then you also get like, um, what time registration opens. So I was like, oh, like this is different. So then they did like an Instagram live of our specific venue, just showing like what we were doing. And so they run heats all day, which is another thing that I didn't know. I met just some people there walking down the street. They're like, oh, you guys look fit. Like, do you do, are you doing this too? And so they were kind of telling us about it. Um, they just start heats at 8 a.m. And then they send a heat off every 10 minutes. And so you oh, wow. sign up for division. They have different divisions. Um, and it takes people, you know, 60 minutes to two hours. And so you could do it with a partner. You could do it as a relay. You could do it as an individual. They have like an open, a pro, and then they have like this elite 15, which wasn't there where, where I was. Um, but basically like you have a track on the outside and there's a line down the middle and they have it, the line down the middle. So if you feel like you run slower, you stay to the outside. If you run faster, you can stay to the inside. So they kind of have two lanes. And to get into the spectator area, they have like two security people, like, like people are just running all day, like just never stops. And you have to like run through to like get cross traffic to the spectator area or to like the warm up or like where you have to go in your heat. Um, so it was pretty wild. So I was just like, we got them like, this is really, I just expected that we were going to have like all these other things to do. Hmm. And then you just show up, like, you just got to be in the tunnel 10 minutes or buy your race start. They write it on your arm and then you go and they just keep sending heats out every 10 minutes, which I thought was really cool because you never really feel like you're the last person left on Mm. the course like so when i was minutes in you know there's all these new people coming onto the course and so Mm -hmm. people warned me of that they're like you might feel like you're running fast and all of a sudden somebody goes flying by you well they might be on their first lap and you're three Mm -hmm. quarters the way done with yours which i thought was really fascinating but we're all running into different stations and so then the other thing is is they have like it's like a yellow in and a, or I could be wrong on the colors. They have one color for in and one color for out. So that way you don't get people colliding. Like you always have to run in and you always have to run out. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, the hardest part I struggled with was counting. So I was literally running, like holding what lap I was on because <laughs> nobody's there counting for you. you don't <laughs> right. time chip. Um, they do know if you skip laps because they're, they can check your time chip, but you have no idea. Like I didn't know mm. where I was on the screen. So Interesting. Okay. I, at first following the girls in front of me and I like overran one of them and I had run back in and then I was like, okay, from now on, I'm just like running with like finger, like my fingers. Um, so That's that awesome. was a little bit, it, it almost made the run go really fast because I just kept repeating like one, one, okay, I'm on one, I'm on one. And then I'd be like, okay, two, two, okay. Now I'm on three. Now I get to go to the next station. So it went really quickly because I was so distracted. Um, Mm. but then you run in and you find your station and they just have them like labeled. So the first station was a skier and you run to the skier. And the other confusing part for us, for me anyways, was they weren't in order. So I was trying to remember Mm. like they didn't have what number, but you had to remember like where to go. So I, I knew like whatever came after skiing, but then I was kind of trying to look around a little, you know, when you're tired, like wandering right. and disappointed, like, what did I just do? Like, where am I going next? Um, so that was just a little bit confusing. I don't think all of the races, it's just the way the venue I did was set up. Um, but when you run in, they have like 50 skiers in a line and they just filter you down. So whoever they know yeah. who's coming in. And so you can kind of tell where you are in that heat, which I thought was really cool. So then coming out the skier, I saw like four girls in front of me. Hey, I'm just going to stick to them. Like I need to catch them. Like they're obviously in front of me. And then you filter in the next station. You could kind of see, did I pass anybody? Where did I stack up? Mm-hmm. Who came up before me? So you can tell. And I think the spectators can tell. Um, but then you go out, you run your laps, you come back in, you go out, you run your laps, you come back in. So it was 
it was completely different than anything I had imagined. Um, everybody's on the course. It just felt like I was running like a 5k or a 10k and you're kind of weaving That's through cool. people. You're, it, everyone's just out there doing it. And it's like, there's yeah. no, there was no money on the line. Everyone's choosing to do this to challenge themselves. And I thought that was really fun. Yeah, that's the, great. Did, the the things like the sled pulls. So it says that they're only fifty meters. Were they super heavy? Were they moderate? Were they light? Like, how would you say the loading was? Because I I couldn't get a good sense of that. Yeah, so this kind of funny. Like we've pushed and pulled thousands of sleds, like in CrossFit, and very very heavy sleds. And the whole time I haven't pushed a sled. It's winter here in Columbus, Ohio. It's cold out. We are, we don't have great sleds for inside. So I was like, well, I'm just going to rely on you know, all the sleds I've pushed in the past. Um, they're super heavy. So the girls was like 360 pounds, I think, 366. Oh, um, wow. In it's like, it looks like the rogue dog sled with the four poles. And yeah. so it's 50 meters, but you go 12 and a half meters out, 12 and a half meters back, 12 and a half meters out, 12 and a half meters back. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and they put it like on this carpet thing. So they say that it should be the same thing at all mm-hmm. of the venues. Which I did talk to a couple. I talked to Lauren Meek. She's the current world record holder, and she said sometimes the sleds are different, which they're trying to fix and put the same sled. I think they just got a new sponsor. Is what I was hearing when I was there. Um, so it's the same sled and the same weights at all of the competitions, from what I understand now, starting in 2024. Um, and then she said that like depending on where you do it, like Houston was so humid, so it mm. just felt like you were just dripping in sweat. Everything was sticky. So there are some variations, just like anything you're gonna see, but. Yeah, the sleds, that is typically most people's crux. Um, most of the runner, anybody coming in with just a running background, mm. they're training to be able to push and pull those sleds. Interesting. Um, their sled pull standard was different. So they had like a line. And this was also, I was tripping all over my rope. I, I was total newbie. I didn't practice any of this before I went in. I just went in to do it. Like I was like, I'm yeah, just going to do this thing. Like, let's just see what happens. And so yep. I did not do sled pull practice. I did not do sled push. I was most worried. And my husband kept being like, Chrissy, you come from a really strong sport. You're going to be fine. Like if you can't push it, I bet you a lot of people can't push it. So right. I was like, oh, thank you. But um, so they have like a line and you just have to grab and they let you like anchor and then walk backwards. And then you drop oh. the rope and walk back up. So it's not a hand over hand sled pull like we're used sure, to, yeah. um, or typically what we would normally do. You might okay. see some people doing it, but they have like you're allowed to do that walk back. So it just interesting. Just different. Um, yep. I don't know yeah. if it's easier or not easier. It's just different. Did you? Was there uh, one of the first things that my brain goes to in my kind of event logistics <laughs> world is is like bottlenecking? Was there ever an issue with bottlenecking on the stations, and and how do they manage that? Do you know? That was the first thing with Patrick and I, my husband, because he did it too. He did it as a um, separate, as a single on the male side. And we both were like, yep. how is it going to work? There was no bottlenecking. Oh, so, cool. Great. Um, at least from what we saw. So I think because they had 50 set out, and I think they sent out 20 to 40 people per heat is give or take. Um, yeah. And then, so even then we caught a couple people in the heats before us, but they had them on the end of the rowers and they filtered the new heat in. So... Um, you might have like two or three people and then they, they knew, I don't know how they knew, maybe it was the color or the, the time on the arm, whatever, but they definitely knew where to put people. So like when I was coming in, even if there was already people on the rower, they were towards the end and they moved us to the Hmm. front. So the spectators could tell kind of was where, um, and then I think I'm trying to think what else. Um, so that was really different. And then they had the amount of machines they had and they do make you submit so if you've ever run like a half marathon or a marathon, they say like, what's your estimated finish time? And they put you in heats based on the Got estimated yep. time and the way they spread out the heats. Um, like they have the same list every uh, venue. It seems like like the pro women go at like 10 a.m. and the pro men go in the evening. Um, so it seems like they've kind of figured it out, like give or take how long people take. But yeah, we didn't have any bottlenecking. I think they said there was like hmm. two or 3,000 people in that event, which I oh, was wow about yeah yeah that's oh, really that's cool crazy. that's great wow yeah and that was like the smallest one um is what they were telling us so we were just learning yeah. so much like i was just I yeah had, yeah I love it. I mean, I think that's just, uh, if we go back again and talk about like the history of CrossFit and what it was originally intended for, kind of being this amalgam of the things that work and push the needle forward, and then using that general physical preparation for other things. Like, I just love that there is uh, 
another outlet or many outlets. I mean, there's all sorts of things, the obstacle course racing, mm -hmm. Ragnaroks, and like, you know, there's all sorts of these different events popping up and gaining in popularity. And personally, I think it's really cool that there is enough of a market and an interest out there in some of these fitness challenges that they can draw people out. I mean, like that's at the end of the day, that's what it all boils down to is more people getting involved in something that is ultimately only going to benefit them and only going to benefit society at large, you know, if we have more people that are fitter and healthier. Um, so I love it. I, I think that's so yeah. cool that there's more outlets for exactly that, you know? Yeah, it's, it's pretty neat. So you show up just, you know, why not? Got to do something. We're bored. You win the thing in uh, you know an hour and four an hour and four minutes. And then I believe you mentioned in the video where you you said uh, your time there that that qualified you for a future competition like that elite fifteen or whatnot in, in a different state. Have you decided whether or not you're gonna throw your hat so, in the ring? I don't know. So I learned about this, like, um, and apparently it's super confusing is what people message me, but I didn't have any, I didn't look anything up ahead of time. I promised Patrick, we were going for fun. I had to promise him I wasn't going to be psycho training for this. So I made sure to like keep myself, I don't want to say disconnected, but just keep doing fitness sure. with what I enjoyed doing and test what I had done in the past, like all the work that I put in. And so I didn't look up any of it, but somebody told me if you were under 65 minutes, which I think was a rule potentially in the past, that is no longer the rule. You, you have to go to, if you would use CrossFit, for example, we have to qualify for the games out of a semifinal or previously it was a sanctional. So they, mm -hmm. they call theirs majors and they designate what those majors are. And mm. run that race and you take, if you win that major or take, maybe it's top three, similar to if I would go to a semifinal and take top five, I now qualified for the CrossFit Games. That's gotcha. how they now do it in 2024. But now they said there's a last chance qualifier. And it's like, oh my gosh, here we go again. <laughs> so they said like, if I really did want to do the Elite 15, that they were all very like, you should do it. Like you, you definitely, your time could be well good enough to be there um but i would have to go to california in may and run it mm. again and qualify through that event because that is considered one of their majors gotcha but okay. they're taking the top four out of that event yeah so <laughs> okay. i don't know i you know it's a maybe I, yeah it's not off the plate because honestly i even told him i was like if i qualified i don't even know if i'd go to the elite 15 i just kind of want to qualify because i want to see if i can um i just right. don't I'm not looking for a new sport. Like I'm looking for a balanced health and fitness lifestyle. I'm not looking for a new sport. I'm look, looking to learn at continuing to expand like my horizon on, you know, how do you train aerobically? How do we train anaerobically? How can we combine the two? How can I be strong? How can I be fit? Like I'm just putting all of those things together because that's what I enjoy doing. And so I think it's very cool. I think it's very fun. I see a lot of our CrossFitters loving CrossFit, but also like if they want to go hop in and do something that challenges their endurance in that way, like I see them potentially doing that and still continuing to do CrossFit and mm -hmm. CrossFit will prepare them for that. They just need to add more running. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, so I haven't decided. Maybe that'll pop up in May. Um, I, did, I just didn't want to like commit without thinking about it because I know how I am when I train for something. I just kind of want to continue doing things that I'm doing and feeling good. Oh, yeah, that's, that's great. That's well, super cool. That that kind of leads me to, uh, I'll reframe the question I asked you earlier. We we talked about like, okay, what are you planning on? Don't want to let the cat out of the bag there. That's cool. But but what else do you kind of want to do that maybe you're thinking about but haven't committed to yet? Like, is there something else kind of in the ether that you're like, oh man, it'd be really cool to do this event, whatever that might be? Yeah, um, I think I would like to, so I'd like to get into some trail races, um, some trail running. So so stuff with a little bit more climbing or elevation or things like that, just to test and see, you know, I live in the Midwest. We don't have a lot of that here, but that mm -hmm. stuff's really hard, potentially ultras. So maybe 50 K 50 mile, hundred mile, um, trail race, things like that, just to really be out on a course for those are going to take four and a half to seven hours. So just to mm -hmm. see, you know, hopefully, can I finish it? Can I do it? I've done a road marathon, which is 26.2. Um, but those 50 Ks are 31 and over. So uh, I've seen a couple of these races floating around where it's like every, or you have 24 hours and you like you keep running, like stuff like that. How many K can you hit before you can't mm -hmm. make your lap? Like just stuff that challenges you more mentally in a different way. So um, yeah. I do like the road, but I think the trail would be really cool. So we're definitely looking at a couple of those. You should check out a race. I think it's called the Tennessee Mile, not too far. You can drive down south of Nashville. I know uh, 
Brian Shantosh did, just did a variant of it, but they have two different races. One of them, and it's it's on a trail, <clears throat> it's on a uh, uh, a ranch, and I think it's a 1.1 mile loop, but it's got some pretty serious elevation gain and loss. And uh, they've got the first style of race where they blow the whistle every 20 minutes, and if you're not at the start line to start the lap, then you're out, and they yeah. just keep going last man standing. So that's one uh, iteration, that's and then they. Yeah, they have another one where it's exactly what you said, where there's, I think, a 4, 8, 12, and 24-hour uh, race, and it's just max laps within that time, up to you to uh, to get it done. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that uh, would be, that'd be pretty cool. So yeah, yeah like stuff like that. Maybe uh, I've done a half Ironman before CrossFit, maybe a full down the road, maybe jump back into another half. Um, again, just trying to test, like, this is more endurance stuff. Um, sure. I still lift. Um, just just trying to put it all together and just do mm -hmm. different stuff that, that doesn't also like that stuff. If I did a full Ironman, I think that would probably like the amount of training that goes into it. It definitely would consume a lot of the life or a lot of, a lot of my life. And so mm -hmm. just trying to also figure out stuff that it's like, how can I balance this? Um, and I think that's really the ultimate goal. So when I do look at things, just kind of making sure like, okay, like, can I still, can I not go back into what I was doing when I was training for the CrossFit games and still be fit and well-rounded in a different way? And how can I fit this into my week? And make sure that I have time for every like relationships and everything else that I'm doing, yeah. or that's a part of my life. Well, I kind of, I guess they're just different. But for me personally, I almost think this is a little cooler. And what I mean is, if you train for like six hours a day, and then you do some incredible accomplishment, you're like, well, that makes sense. You train six hours a day, but if you're like in and out of the gym in an hour. And then you do these amazing things. You're like, wow, like that's an amazing return on your investment for like what you're doing with a relatively small amount of time in the gym yields this incredible payoff and breadth of capacity. That I think is that I think is really cool. That I think is more applicable to most people. And that I think will resonate with a lot of folks. And it's kind of you know you're dipping your toe in that water. So that's that's pretty cool. Well, now first of all, thank you for sharing your story for giving us some of your time it's it's awesome to hear what you're up to and i think people will really enjoy it so if you don't mind you know let people know if they want to you know learn more about you feel free you know instagram youtube channels best ways to connect with you how can people find you yeah um youtube's really fun so our channel is christy aramo o'connell uh instagram is christy aramo i'm christy o'connell but i still go by christy aramo too um and then our gym in Westerville, Ohio is CrossFit Polaris, also known as IVEX Training. And then we have our online fitness app, which is also IVEX Training. So, so any of those ways are really great. Um, and yeah, I just hope that, you know, everybody realizes that you can feel good and still accomplish really cool things. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and as I always uh, forget to say, if you want to help support the show, check out verynotrandom.com for all the cycles that we offer. You own a gym. You want gym management and billing and fitness tracking all in one thing, go to, you know, BTWB's got an all-in-one solution for you. Go to btwb.com slash all-in-one, get on the wait list. And other than that, for Christy Aramo O'Connell, for Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.